only three more panels left. Three more panels. So right now, what I've got for you is special guest Vincent Mikhail Donatelli from Yahweh Games, LLC. And he's going to talk to you about the video production, video game production pipeline. He's been in the industry for two decades, so he knows his stuff. Take it away. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Powell, for having me. Um, just real quick, uh, I put all of my information inside of the Discord chat, inside the workshop chat, so you guys can have that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and light, light up my presentation. So, welcome to my talk on the video game production pipeline. Uh, the purpose for this today is to really try to help people understand how to make a game from start to end and all of the little things that you need in, in the middle. Um, so I have a video game company called Yahweh Games LLC, and we are in the process of rebranding it to Adonai Games. We're the, we're the same company, though. So I am Vincent Mikhail Donatelli. Uh, I've been in the industry for 20 years. Um, I am training to be a rabbi, a messianic rabbi. I'm training to uh, help people understand uh, the Lord and life. And don't worry, we won't get religious in here. Uh, I just want to let you know a little bit about myself. You know, I, I worked on Transformers 3 for PC. I, I worked on Dragon Ball G, uh, GT for Game Boy Advance. I, Starship Troopers for mobiles, pretty much my game um, with my business partner, Ron. I uh, worked on Stargate Worlds once upon a time before it got canceled. And then uh, I got like, I, I think when I made this slide, it was like 33 games, but I think I'm, I'm probably closer to 36 at this point. Um, I've, I've invented this thing called the demo cast, and we're going to get into that hopefully uh, towards the end. Um, which is basically how people should write a demo reel from, you know, from here moving forward. Um, I used to teach at the Art Institute of Houston uh, and, you know, I teach at Avant, Avant Media Institute. I teach at University of Houston and I teach at Lone Star College. But my company exists because we are the first and leading video game studio in the world that teaches people how to make video games. So just to clarify, I'm not the first and leading video game studio but we're the first and leading video game studio that's teaching and instructing video game development. Nobody's doing this. We're in a space all into ourselves, which I, I'm really happy about. So we have Adonai Games Trade School. It's basically a life coach and mentorship program. And uh, we do consultation. We do business to business um, uh, development. So we'll create assets for people. We'll create apps. Um, whatever you know, businesses need in this realm, this is what we're here for. And we really work well with marketing teams too. We are also making our own video games. So we have this video game. I know this is a hot topic for people in terms of the patriarchy, but that's okay. Uh, it has a time and a place for everything. But we have our game, our first game that we're working on called Patriarchs and the Monster Caravan. And, um, you know, we know that religious games in general have a bad stigma. And for the most part, they suck. And we're trying to do something different. We're in a market unto ourselves, and we've got the most ambitious religious game probably ever made. Um, and so that's what we're, that's what we're, we're focusing on right now. So, um, you know, when you're, when you're making a game, whether it's religious or not, you know, the whole idea is you want people to be, to, to be able to play it and people will buy it even if, if your game's in a failed market. So here are some of our artwork. We've got a trailer for our game, uh, that's out and we, we, I can put that in the link a little later, but, um, you know, we, we have been working on this demo for about three years and it's completely finished. And basically where we're at is we're shopping for partners and investors. But you're here to discuss the video game production pipeline. So who is this really for? It's for older teams looking to fine tune their production uh, pipe and also for folks learning how to build a video game studio for scratch, from scratch. So let's skip the religious stuff for a minute and let's talk about uh, the outline. We've got this, these 10 phases of production that, that we've got to deal with. And, uh, you know, everything starts with the idea. Pre-visualization is basically your product before the product. Um, and pre-production, production, and post-production, all of this is also inside of pre-vis. So pre-vis is, yes, it's, it's, it's the, the idea made the life, but you still have to go through some of the phases of production in order to bring out the pre-vis uh, demo as a whole. You know, quality assurance is the ability to, to test your game to make sure it works. Then you've got the, the goal, la, 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 which is like, you know, you have gold and marketing and publishing. You have sales and distribution. You have taxes, pay them. 
and then you have vacation because if you're not going on vacation then you're just going to burn yourself out and kill yourself. So let's talk about production for the most part. I know just look guys, I got 50 minutes and I'm, I'm really blazing through this. I want to really want to be able to answer questions at the end. So um, if you get a headache at the end of this, know that that's, <laughs> that's kind of normal. So we've got the idea, right? So everybody's got an idea. I want to make a video game, but look, put your idea in a five sentence synopsis. If you can't communicate your idea to somebody in a short five sentence uh, paragraph, then your idea is just needs more time. You need to give it more love. Once you have those five sentences knocked out, turn those five sentences into five, into five paragraphs. And that is be the beginning of your game design document. You have to count the cost and then you need the reference. You need people to understand both on your team and your business partners. What is this game like? All right. So uh, pre-visualization, that's the next stage. So we have uh, the game development uh, uh, document, the GDD, right? Some people call it a, a game Bible. I call it, I call that jargon hacking. Leave the Bible where it is and you guys work on a game design document. That's my two cents about that. Um you know, inside of your game design document, you've got a script and your budget has to be part of this. So you've counted the cost. Now you have to, to budget it out and divide it into your departments. You're going to have these things called asset control lists and sub asset control lists. What is an asset control list or an ACL? An ACL is basically an inventory of assets. And, um, you know, I was talking to Mr. Long earlier and he's an animator. And so his his if he was the animation director for his department, he would need an inventory of assets for all of the characters in the game, both the player character and all of the enemies and all the bosses and all the mini bosses. He's got to have his own list. And that list is going to look different than the list for the modeling department. And that modeling department is going to look different than the audio department. So you've got to create lists and it's, and it is a, a daunting task, but it makes everybody's life easier. If you have like one master Excel sheet, and then you have tabs down at the bottom of your Excel sheet. Just put everybody's department in there. It just helps. helps, And then you can put the budget in there too. It just helps all around for all your management. You're also going to need a contractor's list. of, And I think this is a, a big part where people fail in the beginning is that they're like, oh, well, I'll go ahead and work on my demo or I'll go ahead and work on, on, this, on this wonderful thing. And then once I get funded, then I'll worry about who I want to bring on with me. Like, no, do that. Along the way and in the beginning, you're going to find artists that you didn't know existed. Write those people down, write their email address down, reach out to them, start a relationship with them. You know, you'll find out quickly there are people who you want to work with and then people you don't want to work with. So this contractor's list is very important. And then try to nail down what is a vertical slice demo going to look like. So basically between one and two, I, I like to use Spider-Man and, and I use this a lot in my examples when I instruct. I'm basically going to say, hey. Look, if you want to make a Spider-Man game, you have to have a character web sling from one point to another and swing on a pendulum and then probably walk on some walls. If you can't program that, then you have no business making a Spider-Man game. So whatever thing, whatever your idea is going to be, you've got to be able to have a proof of concept and then flesh that proof of, proof of concept out, spend three months on it. If you're spending any more than that time on it, you're, you're probably moving into bootstrapping your own product and art is never done and programming is never done. And you've got to be able to, 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 to say, no, enough is enough. We're not, this is the goal and we're not going over the goal. So let's make sure that we're, we're hitting that goal and that target of three months. Okay. Pre-production department. This is the 2d department. Now, look, I've dealt with a lot of clients over the, the ages and they're like, Hey, you're a better artist than me. Therefore, you can draw better than me. And because you can draw better than me, that means you can draw anything. Like, no, understand that when you're hiring a 2D artist, they're only good at about six different things. So let's categorize those things and we'll come back to the wells, the blueprinting and the polisher. Just a moment. So actors, anything that's going to have a personality to drive your story. You've got transportation, land, sea and air vehicles. Now, dynamic props and st static props. Usually, I've you know I've met a lot of people in different different companies, and they're like, ah, just put them in the same bin. No, you've got one set that has skeletal meshes in them, and you've got one set that are just static props. So, like a gun, it's got you know a forward assist, it's got uh, a charging handle. Uh, I'm describing an M4 carbine. It's got a magazine. It's got a, 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 a scope on top. It's got 
uh, buttstock that's collapsible. You've got a, um, a suppressor that you put on the front. So all of these things have sockets that you're going to have to create and program. And you've got literally a character that's going to take the magazine out and put a new magazine in. They have animatable parts. This is a dynamic prop, something like a desk or a mouse or a keyboard, something that people are just going to kind of like observe as filler in the room. That's a static prop. And if I'm, if I'm being really honest, one is more of an architectural's mindset and the other one is more of an engineer's mindset. And you have to know your artists and know what they're capable of doing. And you as an artist, you're either going to fall into the engineer camp or you're going to fall into the architecture camp. And so that's what the, basically the, the four, five and six is about environment, skybox, terrain, water, foliage, architecture, residential, commercial, industrial, military, interior and exterior, and then static props. This is all architectural mindset. You know, when, when say, well, how, how does a, how does a character fit into an engineer's mindset? And that's because the human body is engineered. It's 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 got, you know, muscle groups and sinew and, and, and tendon and ligament. And it's it's an engineer's mindset. You, you have to know how a character moves in order to make it look correct. So, so now that we have these six basic under, you know, classifications of art, if you will, excuse me, what we want to do is we want to get into how does an artist think? And, and, and like, what does a real true 2D artist look like? Well, you have the bottomless well. If you're a concept artist and you have pictures on napkins and you have the, an orc that you designed and his core, core body is underneath the seat in your car and you've got stuff uh, about his breastplate in, in your bathroom because you were drawing on a towel or, you know, you've got art everywhere all over the house. Well, then you're a bottomless well. And you're, you are the key element to everything here because... True creativity comes from this place. They are so right-brained in their, in their, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. They're so right-brained in their caring and their creativity that they're almost left-brained. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating. So true creativity is falling here. Blueprinting is, is an engineer's artist. So like, let's say we have, you know, Batman and, and he's, he's, you know, we have this new costume that he's going to wear. Well, the 2D bottomless wells uh, artist is going to go ahead and create this Batman. And now we've got to do front, side, left, court, three quarter view, top view. That's a blueprint. So we can take that blueprint and give it to the 3D modeling department. Um, and we'll get into ZBrush and, and uh, 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 versus traditional 2D here later. So don't worry. That's going to be a topic of discussion. Then you've got the polisher. The polisher is the art director. That person has so much experience that they're going to put the sprinkles and, and the whipped cream and the cherry on top of your three-quarter view uh, image. They're the ones who are going to build sales presentations. They're going to be, be the ones who are getting your information out. They're the ones who are who are so unbelievably polished in their skill set that they're leading the other team to the finish line, all right? So that's why you have those three different categories of person. Next, in the 2D department, we have the user experience department. It was formerly known as marketing, or it was currently, it was, it was formerly known as the graphic design department. They're building the shiny thing. They want, they want people to see all different kinds of products. Every time you go to Patreon, every time you go to Kickstarter, like these are the, these are the moments where like, hey, come take a look at my, my product, right? But it's not just about the, 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 the shiny thing. It's the thing that sells the shiny thing. Um, what that means is just because you have a really nice looking shiny thing, you have to have a campaign that's built around that. So constant theme, uh, consistent theming. So, you know, Iron Man one, when it came out, it was mind blowing, especially the user interface. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that that user interface that's inside the movie gets carried over to the mobile games. It gets carried over to the, uh, console games. It gets carried over to the DVD, but that user experience faltered. And they had all different kinds of graphic designers trying to outdo each other and nothing was consistent. So that's what I mean by consistent theming. So you have mood, color, temperature, palette, you have style and cool factor. Your website should also be a part of that consistent theming. And, and also in this department, we're building menus and icons. We're building mer merchandise and, and swag. The audio department should live here. It's building that experience. Like, I don't know if you guys played Final Fantasy VII anything like, but but what I've noticed is over the course of time, what ties sequels into each other is remixes of original audio. So like the Dirge of Cerberus didn't have any of the original audio, but it had some of the sound effects. So there was a little bit of a tie-in and consistency inside of this user ex experience. Lastly, and probably the most important uh, uh, part of this is the story and the game flow. We want to make sure everything's flowing together. 
So now we've got to get into the 3D production part of the pipeline. So we left the 2D department. We, we kind of are, are, are leaving pre-visualization for a moment. Now we've got to discuss how are we dealing with the 3D production pipeline? And the answer is there are so many people in this world that are so great at ZBrush. And I want to make sure that people are not creating art for art's sake in terms of submitting their portfolio to video game development studios. Like art for art's sake is wonderful, it's beautiful, but it's a lot of times it's very useless once the technical animator gets their hands on it, meaning the edge loops are bad. They don't understand that people have latissimus dorsi. They don't understand that they have deltoids and that deltoids twist and move in a certain way. So they're not developing art for the next person in line. They're only developing art for themselves in the moment. And they think that, you know, wonderful art is going to draw in a crowd but that's a lot of times where people falter because that animation director, a lot of that, a lot of that weight of bad art falls on them. And part of that reason is because of bad edge loops. Bad edge loops has a lot to do with people starting in ZBrush and not building tools that are proper inside of 3D Max. And then once you build tools that are really great first in Max or Maya or Blender, or whatever you're using, then you export those out to ZBrush and you start working and sculpting on top of great edge loops. All right. Yes, one percent or to, to the one uh, to, to the top ten percent of our all artists in the world. No one understand this. But for ninety eight or ninety ninety percent of the rest of the video game industry, it's indie. So therefore, don't make bad art. And and I'll get into that uh, I'll probably outside of of this presentation. So we we've got to build a good blueprint, front side, three quarter back view. This is our kingly reference. When, when you're developing blueprints for your art team, you don't want your 3D artist to have to go Google anything. You want great character head sheets. You want great phoneme sheets. You want great uh, 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 character boards. You want great uh, uh, model sheets. These documents should be held over and given to the 3D modeling department and then disconnect the internet from, from, from the 3D modeler. And because if all the King League reference is right there, ready for them, they can focus and just worry about what's in front of them. That means you might have to build a 3D uh, turnaround, or I'm sorry, a 2D turnaround of the breastplate. It might mean you need a 2D turnaround of the shoes that they wear. It might mean that you build a 3D turnaround of their hair, right? But this is part of that process. So once that 3D model is created, it's going to get split between two departments. The 3D model itself is in the modeling department, but you want to send that model almost immediately out, out to the technical animator, which is in the, 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 rigging, the rigging artist. The technical animator's uh, job is to put a skeleton inside of the 3D model and then skin it and pass it off to the actual animator. Once the animator has it, then they can start animating actions. And there's a lot of people that don't know that these are different jobs. And uh, I'm working on, on a second episode of my, of my demo cast and I've learned that there are two different types of rigging uh, artists. You have the technical animation engineer, a TAE, and what they're designed to do is create rigs from scratch. And then you have the technical animation designer, and these people are a TAD. And what they're going to do is they're going to take a, a rig that's already been made and just rig it and skin it and move forward. Uh, Character Studio Biped is a great example of this. Complete Animation Tools or CAT for 3D Max is excellent at this. If you're designing a rig in Maya, you either have a rig that you've been working on for years and you've been tweaking it out. But if there's one thing that I've learned about Maya animators is you, they have their fingerprints on every thousands of rigs out there and there's very little consistency. And unless you've had almost elite training, it's very hard to actually adapt from one rig to the next, especially if you're a beginner. So if you're a beginner, especially a beginning animator, I would say use 3D characters, uh, 3D Max Character Studio Biped or use complete animation tools. Okay, back in the modeling department. Once your model's done, it's gotta get unwrapped and you can use an intern for this, okay? Unwrapping, there's two different kinds. There's an American version, just look at anything Epic Games does, and then there's the Japanese style. And look at anything that Square Enix does. Just do a quick Google search for the modeler's resource and look up Final Fantasy Dissidia. And almost any character that you see there, you're gonna see a, uh, you can do an image search for this. So you can you can see immediately what I'm talking about between an American style of unwrapping versus a Japanese style. And pixels are square, therefore put your unwrap on a grid. And you'll maximize the quality and the output of, of all your textures and especially your normal maps. So once your character's unwrapped, 
whether you do it in ZBrush or you do it in Max, it, you know, it depends on whether you're in the top 10% or the, in the bottom 90%, right? Uh, doesn't matter. But then once you're done unwrapping it, you want to get through there and you want to start texturing and sculpting it. And that can be done in Substance or ZBrush. Then you've got to worry about your materials. Materials draft, okay? The, the, the materials artist, if you're working in Unreal or Unity, this is a career. And most people don't understand, especially when you're starting out, coming out of school, this is a career. Materials is very tied into production rendering, uh, whether it's Arnold, whether it's rendering in Unreal, whether it's uh, rendering in Unity. Okay, so now, now that we've kind of gone through the, the fundamentals of who we're dealing with, and by the way, each one of these is its own position. So if you have a thousand models that you have to build out of your asset control list, it might be a good idea to get different people to do this job, to do all these different jobs. Okay, so you have the 2D department. The 2D department, you have actors, transportation, dynamic props, environments, architecture, static props. Each artist is probably going to only be good at two of those six things. So if you are a 2D artist, just pick two. Now, there are savants that exist. I'm not talking about the top 10% of all artists. I'm talking about the 90% of you who are trying to acquire high income skill. Just focus on these two things and grow your portfolio out of here. Same goes for the 3D department. You might be able to do anything that you set your mind to and, and, and bless you for being able to do that. But to grow your portfolio, to swell it up, just pick two and hammer in on those two. Okay, so get a 2D actor, uh, uh, 2D artist, and get a 3D actor artist. Get a 2D transportation artist, get a 3D transportation artist. Look, if you do this one-to-one -one thing, it's going to work out great. And this is fundamental, but you don't have to just get six for one department and six for the other. You can get 36 for one department and 36 for the other. All right. It, it, it's, it's all about scaling up once you have your core team. So once you're done creating all these assets, then they've got to go to the scene assembler. So they're going to go from the 2D department to the 3D department. You're going to export them out. It's going to get assembled inside of the 3D uh, uh, engine. So I, I'm from here on out, I'm just going to refer to the 3D engine as Unreal because we're, we're in Unreal Studio, but we have quite a few games under our belt using Unity. All right. So scene assembler, it is the most stressful position on the team. They are responsible for, for managing thousands of files. So name, look, there's a reason why I had mentioned asset control list. If you name all of your stuff inside your asset control list, the scene assembler can look at that asset control list and say, your stuff's not named according to this list. And your, your scene assembler might help you build a naming convention out of this. Use Unreal's naming convention. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years trying to develop a structure so you can find files quickly. Don't try to do something different. You're just going to waste time. Use what's already available to you. All right. It might be a great idea to get this person an assistant. So uh, check your work against ACL. And uh, so, so again, pay, pay for their source co control certification. Like if you, if you have the ability to pay for them to get certified in source control, this is one thing that, that will help benefit the whole entire team. Source control is a big issue in general, and you might need a different person on call to deal with source control. But in the meantime, at least the scene assembler can try to handle this. Take this person out to lunch with you can uh, when you can. I I've seen studios that they'll they'll hire a masseuse and just be like, "Hey, scene assembler, let's let's go. Excuse me, let's go get you a massage and come back, and you can go back to work." They're 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 very uh, they're a very underestimated uh, uh, position. Okay, production notes. <sighs> Try to keep your 3D artists offline. Keep them off the internet, all right? Uh, it's not because you're punishing them. It's just so they can focus. So uh, again, we talked about the ZBrush thing already. Um, there's a difference between creating art for art's sake and creating art for the animator. We discussed this. The education of the majority of 3D modelers do not know how to model for the animator. We talked about this, but I can't stress it enough. The vast majority of artists can only produce two of the six classifications of art. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. We've already discussed that. So. Um, let's talk about the, the demo cast for a minute. So what is a demo cast? Uh, a demo cast is my new version of a demo reel. So I've seen so many de demo reels and, and hundreds of them throughout my life. And I myself am a victim of doing what my educator told me to do. Everybody knows a demo reel is like, according to that old method of, of understanding, it's five minutes. It's three to five minutes of a video and everybody's going to mute the audio right away. I'm going to help you get around that. 
Your demo cast should be your preliminary interview about who you are. And you make your own captions or subtitles or whatever you want to call it about what your narrative is supposed to be. Build value. Tell people who you are. Tell people what you want to get into, what, what you're trying to do for a studio. Tell people uh, like, like what your goals are. And when you have those subtitles down there and people are actually paying attention to your demo reel and they see subtitles, their instinct is to turn the audio back on and they can hear your passion. They can hear your joy. They can hear who you are as a person. And you're cutting through all of the other garbage of, of all the other bad de demo reels that are out there. And there are tremendously bad demo reels, right? So, so you be a professional and help that, that person who's looking at your reel. You help them by solving their problems. If you're going to be an animator, I want you to tell me how you're going to solve my animation problems. So this means build value, build value in your demo cast. And, and inside the chat, I've, I've got my, my demo cast example. Um, and, and it's new. I had no reference. I had nobody to show me how to do this. I had to cr like create this out of nothing. All right. So moving forward in terms of the most important aspect to any video game is to play it. A video game nerd says that quite often. So your animation department is what separates you from the cinematic experience. So we need to discuss in terms of animation, you have a gameplay animator and you have a cinematic animator. What's the difference? One's helping play with interactivity. That means you press a button and, in, and action happens. I, I can't tell you how many games I've played where I can press the punch button and go make tea and go use the restroom and come back. And now all of a sudden the guy's returning to idle. And it's because... What people do is they don't realize that when you watch The Incredibles and you watch a person throw a punch, that person's throwing a punch in real time. That might be about 45 seconds, uh, or, or I'm sorry, 45 frames to actually throw the punch and return to idle. Whereas when you actually press a button in Street Fighter, when you throw a jab with Ryu, his jab lands on frame five. It's incredibly fast. Interactive animation is different than cinematic animation. And so if you're trying to hire an in-game animator, don't hire a cinematic animator to do this. They're on two completely different spectrums. Cinematic animation is purely to push the story for forward. And that's part of what the animation department is designed for. It's designed that once the script is completed, you give us the script, we create a storyboard out of it, we cut and edit the dialogue, we put an animatic to it. That means we combine the audio and the storyboard together. We make an animatic video and this is our new asset control list. So that means every time we start blocking out scenes, we take those preview files back inside of After Effects or our Avid or whatever we're using and, or, or, and we replace those panels with an actual action sequence of the blockout. So all of the 2D uh, uh, boards go away. Now we have an asset control list of all our our cinematic scenes, our camera cuts. And each camera cut is its own file. Uh, sometimes you'll have multiple, but for the most part, that's a studio decision. That's a department decision. Okay, so once you block out your animation, you wanna work on your second pass, which means you're putting a little bit more life to it. The polish is what's known as the spline pass. And, and it basically looks like if you had to ship it out before lighting and rendering took its course, you could do that. But also part of polish is post-production, visual effects, sound effects, you're rendering the thing out. So once you polish it and the animation looks amazing and you render it and you apply the visual effects and the sound effects, well, you're re-editing down to a final cut and then you have to export it out to Codex. Okay, well, what about the programmers? The programmers are kind of like omnipotent and they're everywhere. So I don't live here. I will tell you what other programmers have told me to tell you guys in terms of be aware of these things because I, I like if it's possible I, I use this term as a joke but it's kind of like defines where my heart was f was past tense for a long time but I used to be racist against programmers I've had bad taste in my mouth for programmers for years because I've gone through in one game we went through about 34 or 35 different programmers because I didn't realize that I didn't have the education that I needed in order to help programmers but then there's that whole other side where you have to learn that you're dealing with a specialist and a generalist. A specialist, when you're trying to put a specialist in charge of your project, um, it's a bad idea. Don't do that. Because what will happen is, and what's the difference between the two? Uh, let's just start with generalist. The generalist will say, hey, uh, I need you to do X, Y, Z. Here's your list. And a lot of times they'll say, no, I, I can't do it or it can't be done or it can't be done cheaply. And then what they'll do 
is they'll go in a corner and they'll program magic. And then, then one day they'll say, Hey, uh, remember 10 minutes ago when I said it can't be done, I just did it here. Look what I did. And what they'll do is they'll surprise you every single time, every single time they'll surprise you because they know for some reason, psychologically, this is a mental thing. They know that if they tell, you no, now they have to prove themselves right. A specialist will say, yeah, of course it can be done. And then you say, okay, we'll go do it. And then they just sit on it. And what, what, what my experience is with, with programmers is, oh, well, I don't have the character yet. Oh, I don't have the textures yet. Oh, I don't have the normal map yet. Oh, I don't have the materials yet. Oh, I don't have the animation yet. Oh, I don't have. And, and they'll give you a list of all these things that they don't have rather than actually doing something with what they do have. This is a problem. And so that's why I'm saying learn the difference between what a specialist is and what a, what a generalist is. That said, now we have to deal with the different categories of programming. Hardware programmer is going to help you out with the hardware. They're communicating with the CMOS and the motherboard and the graphics card and making sure that your software is working properly. There's going to be very little circumstances in your life if you're an indie studio where you need to hire a hardware programmer. A software engineer is going to develop the application for you. And, and, and in a lot of ways, you're going to need a software engineer because they're going to be the one helping you build your program. So you have software engineers that engineer the software, but then you have software engineers that are helping you in the editor. And this is what I'm talking about over here. It's the software engineer who does editor programming. doesn't matter if you download a template off uh, online. doesn't matter if they build it themselves out of, out of Unreal. This is who this person is. You have a scripter. That, so, so the software engineer is going to say, hey, Here's, here's my uh, my root code. Here's all my character actor code. And then the scripter is going to access the actor code and is going to say, hey, I'm going to make a rocket launcher out of this. Or uh, better yet, I'm going to make a gun out of this. So this is a gun class. And we're going to go ahead and create a gun class of rockets, snipers, pistols, and melee. Okay. And then from here, now someone says, a low-level scripter comes along and says, I'm going to call this an M203 grenade launcher. Oh, I'm going to use uh, uh, an M9 Beretta. Or I'm going to use an M M82 uh, Barrett. Okay, so they're they're being very specific to the actual personality of the of the weapon or the personality of the character. All right, so you have the generalist um, 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 code for scripting, and then you have the personality of who this character is in the game. Lastly, you have toolers. You have someone who's going to design software plugins. A good example is 3D Max is the software engineer, but the tooler is the one who created the unwrap tool or Character Studio Biped, or inside of Unreal Engine, it could be uh, Havoc or 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 Chaos or you know other visual effects like Ni Niagara. Those are tools that are built into the engineer itself, and into the, into the software uh, engineer's work itself. Okay, I've got like a little less than fifteen minutes, so let's get this done. We're halfway through post production and quality assurance. We've got the visual effects department, which is the I call this the abstract department. These guys are the far right brained people. They are so unbelievably creative that they're that they have to take the elements of the world, right? Listed here, earth, wind, water, fire, metal, sun, moon, good and evil and righteousness. And they have to convert this to a particle. This is abstract art in its finest in motion, right? So I wrote these down like this to try to help people like get a launching pad of what you're looking for. If you're looking for a visual, visual effects artist, well, this is what you're looking for plus weather systems, okay? Visual effects artist as well, probably really good at lighting materials, rendering and editing. That's probably where they live, all post-production. Quality assurance. Now, now I, I need to make this statement too. Don't look for a unicorn. Your, your objective as a manager, as a good manager and a good leader is not to find a web artist with five years of HTML that can do 3D, that knows Java and C Sharp and C++, who can build your website, who can incorporate Sketchfab, who can do all your marketing for you. That's a unicorn. Stop that. For the love of God, who I love and who I serve, stop doing that. If you're an HR person, I apologize to you that you've not had the right training, but don't, don't look for a unicorn anymore. We can talk about unicorns another day. It's, I'm joking, but I'm being serious too. Okay. Quality assurance, the QA department, break the game. This is what your whole entire department is looking for you to do. You're, you're not looking for bugs and you're not looking, uh, you're not looking to, to find mistakes in the game. You're looking to break it. 
So there's hardware crashes and there's software crashes. You ever been using your phone on an app or do something and your phone turns off? That's a hardware crash. Or have you been working on your computer and the power's on in your house and your computer just turns off? That's a hardware crash. Software crashes, you're on your phone or on your computer and it locks up and you have to go to the task manager to close it. If you can replicate those things, that's what you're looking to do. And that's what this department is designed for. Your, your whole entire existence is to iterate the alpha. So as soon as your three month timeline is up and you got Spider-Man swinging and he's moving around, you can have him walk on walls and fight bad guys. You want to get that in the hands of QA as quick as possible so that they can start breaking your game. And once it's, once they can't find any breaks, you might have to set a timeline and say, okay, we're only going to break the game for three weeks or two weeks. We're going to need 30 people in order to do it and pay these 30 people to do it or hire EA Tiburon to do it. That's, that's where I used to work, right? You can go ahead and get somebody and pay somebody to break your game for you. So once you're in that state, then you can release it to the public and say, hey, look at my game. What do you think? It's a public beta. And you get them to write down more crashes or, bu or, or, or bugs. You can write down bugs at this point, okay? But what you're building is a crash control list and you're dealing with bug fixes. And this is this is where uh, CD Projekt Red was, was getting hit hard. I think that's one of the best games ever made is Cyberpunk. Honest to God, I think it's a masterpiece. And they, they had a very hard time with the QA aspect of it. Uh, I won't get into what my, my theory is. I'm just telling you that all the crashes were occurring and they didn't have enough of it written down and they weren't addressing enough of it fast enough. Okay, so bug list is secondary. Uh, develop a, a system of departmental responsibility um, everybody, okay, standards is a, is a different type of, of stuff. So what I mean by standards is if your game is for the PlayStation and you have your, your user experience department and they're, de they're developing all of the icons for a PlayStation, well, you can't ship those buttons like, you know, press X or press circle or press triangle. You can't ship that on an Xbox. Those are called standards. So you have to make sure that you're shipping those buttons according to the right thing. You can go ahead and play test it all you want on one kind. But when you're getting ready to port or ship over, you've got to have the other the other buttons ready to go. Okay, so marketing, advertising, and selling. What's the difference here? Why should you know about it? Why what, what's going on with the anatomy of this campaign? Again, marketing is the shiny thing, and what you want to do is you want to be able to to, to co-op and exist with influencers. Uh, a, a, you're creating a music video. You're creating a video. You're creating something for radio. You're creating images. This is your shiny thing. Advertising is the trade-off for dollars to the shiny thing. This is where I would spend money on Twitter. I would spend money on YouTube in order to get views. Personally, I think going viral, there's a lot of mythology behind that. Um, they, they say that if you have 2 million views on something, you're guaranteed 200,000 interested people. And out of those 200,000 interested people, 20,000 of them are going to buy you buy from you guaranteed. It doesn't matter what you put out. They're going to buy from you. But it takes money to get your product in front of 2 million people, right? So that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's what advertising is, is just getting your eyes on the product. Then lastly, it deals with sales and closing. Now that people's eyes are on your product and you funneled them to your website or to, to Steam or wherever you're sending your game off to, You've got to be able to close the deal. That means they've got to be able to put their credit card in. And that means they're on that list to get that game out and in into their possession. That's closing them. And you've got to be able to distribute it when your game's out. This right here, this is a little diagram of something that I put together that when you're looking for investors, when you're looking for publishers, you, you've got to be able to explain to them. And, and this, again, this is not my full, like I don't use this particular slide. I've got more information about this, but you know, how are you dividing your game up in terms of cost? How are you, how are you going to split your hundred percent down to all of your other people in terms of percentages? If you're offering people percentages, well, you need to tell your investor that, oh, I gave 22% to this particular group of people or to this person, right? Because that's 22% that that investor is not going to have. And then they need to be able to say, well, out of a hundred percent of the work, Apple's going to take 30% of it. Google Play is going to take 40% of it. So what are you leaving me with, right? You need to be able to explain these numbers to your partner or your publisher. Lastly, we've got to deal with the taxes. Do not skip your taxes. That means 
1099 NEC, the non the non employee compensation contractors, W twos, W nines. If you're an indie studio, you're responsible for these people who have given their life to do work for you. You have to give them these documents so that they don't get in trouble with the IRS. You don't have a choice here. This is something that you have to do. Be responsible with that. Lastly, enjoy the work of your hands. If you're if if you're working and you're doing business for other people, you need to be able to make money so you can go and take your family on vacation. The divorce rate in this industry is sickening. It's sickening. It's terrible. And and a lot of it has to do with we don't know how long games are supposed to take. Now we've got this new term quadruple A production, right? Um and 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 our costs are going to start skyrocketing and we're forever enslaved but, but right in front of the machine that we're on. You've got to plan your life out and be able to take some breaks. Otherwise, you're going to have a nervous breakdown. Okay, so where am I at? We've we've concluded with the video game production pipeline. Um, you know, this is a slide. You guys can read through this on your own. It's on it's on YouTube. This is where we're at. We're like and what my philosophy is in looking for a business partner. Okay, but but really, here's my ask. Like, I'm looking for a business mentor who can help me grow and scale my business. I'm looking for a sales team who can really help me. I need a sales manager to help oversee my team. I'm trying to get brand recognition out for, for my, my company. Now, we have Woven. I want to explain Woven to you guys. This is so important for me because this has been a, a, a conversation with my grandfather and I. When I graduated college, my grandfather looked me dead in the eye and, and he looked at my demo reel and he's like, I don't understand how this how anything that you're going to do for the rest of your life is going to benefit society. And he walked away. Like he didn't say good job. Congratulations from graduating. Didn't say any of that to me. And um, I knew it was in his heart. So like, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Oh, he's a crappy patriarch or whatever. Come on. Don't, don't do that. What I'm saying though, is it lit a fire in my heart to say, you know what? He's right. And I need to refocus on what I'm doing. So we came up with a program called woven. It means widows, orphans, veterans, emergency assistance, and the neglected. And that means for every business transaction that we do, we take a percentage of the funds that we get in and we give it to different widows and organ, uh, widows uh, uh, through our congregation. We help orphans out or the fatherless. OK, same same kind of group of people. Um, we help take care of, of veterans who are who are just not being paid attention to by the VA. Um, the the uh, emergency assistance is if people just need need financial assistance, but we want to help educate them to be more responsible with their own income and the neglected, meaning the homeless and, and those that are looked at in society as uh, uh, like just not you know being generally taken care of. This particular program, I'm in the middle of trying to get um, a, a 501 nonprofit. Uh, I'm not there yet, but this is, I've got a lot going on and this is something that I, I need to do. But we're still giving regardless of whether we are religiously, we need to do this regardless of where we are. We need business to consumer sales representatives. That means we need help getting some new students. We need business to business sales people helping us in the energy sector. This is important for us because we do a lot of oil and gas work with BP Oil and other people in Houston. Um, business to business sales doing art and assets, uh, art assets and and projects in general. Um, I, I'm I'm looking for a director to help assist me with with uh, what we're executing. Uh, I need payroll and finance people. I need user experience people. I need a, a visual effects people and an audio systems engineer, meaning we're programming audio. Like all of this stuff is coming for us, but we, we I still have to ask. You know, lastly, I want to thank, thank the team. Thank everybody here. You know, Mr. Powell and Mr. Long, thank you both for reaching out to me. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a really great experience talking to you guys. And, you know, Ms. Cooper, Ms. Chandler, and Mr. Murray, um, I know that we really haven't had any interaction, but I know you're a part of this too. So I appreciate everything that you guys are doing. I can't believe I got this thing done with three minutes this year. <laughs> oh, and you still got some time if you wanted to discuss anything else or or that you might have missed or had to gloss over. That is totally okay. So, um, I, I think I, I would be be better use of my time answering questions, uh, maybe in the Discord chat. Look, guys, if you guys ever want to get a hold of me, I'm I'm pretty much available. We can make appointments and whatnot. Like today, I, I left this open for you guys today. If you guys have questions for me, hit me up on Discord. It's the best way to do it. And I'd like to say this too. Um, I know that there's there's the 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 indie game business. Um, uh, we make schedules and make appointments through Zoom or through Skype or whatever. Look, guys, you know, in all honesty, I lost my son recently, and I, this is just not something that I'm I've been I've been able to do. So I've got all this complex life going on in, in my in my 
in my atmosphere, and I just wasn't able to accomplish anything. But Discord, go get, go get me in Discord, guys. Right on, right on. And you are in the indie game business server, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. I, I actually posted in the workshop chat. I put put all my my information in there, and so awesome. uh, I'm going to jump in there in a minute. So, okay. Thank you. So, uh, well, did you want to go into a little bit more detail about your career so far? Like, like, how did uh, you start out? Let's start out from the very beginning. <laughs> So uh, I owe a lot of my career to uh, some guys in Sunrise, Florida called Shadows and Darkness. Um, these uh, Devin Brown was my animation mentor, and uh, he was he's, he's an amazing guy. And um, I was in his class, and I wasn't supposed to be there. My roommate had him as, a, as an animation instructor. He's like, well, you got to come to this guy's class. And uh, so I went there, and he's like, I, I called Roll, and you didn't ca call your name. I'm like, why are you here? I was like, because I, I heard your pretty awesome. And he's like, you're, you must be serious if you came in. So he looked at my portfolio about a month later. Uh, I saw we, uh, there was a website called 3d cafe and that's where we used to go find 3d jobs. Mm -hmm. And there was an ad for this company looking for an animator. So I, I made the appointment. They looked at my demo reel. They're like, yeah, you've got something here. And so I'm talking with a couple owners and they're like, yeah, he's late. He's never late. And, uh, I'm like, well, who's this guy I'm supposed to meet? And they're like, oh, his name is Devin. I was like, what? And then like, I turned around and he's walking in the door and he goes, no way you're the same guy. I was like, no way you're the same guy. And that's, that's how we started. And I, I, it was like fate or whatever. So my first game was working on Dragon Ball. I, I had a couple animation tests that I had to do. And right out the gate, I worked on Dragon Ball G uh, GT transformations and I've been animating ever since. Um, you know, there's there was a time in my life where I, I got really burned out in the industry and got burned out hard. And, and I took a year off to go work with my dad. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, after that particular job ended, I decided, hey, I'm going to go back and do this again. So now here we are. Right on. OK, so after that, you were there for how long? I was with Shadows of Darkness as a contractor for six years. Mm. Um, and uh, after that, I just did whatever I could to continue working as a contractor for other video game studios. Um, I ended up working for the government for a very long time too. Um, we, I, there was this company called iMedia IT, Interactive Media, Interactive Technology. And our company existed to help soldiers uh, be civil with other governments. So we would teach them what's called cult cultural awareness and also civil affairs. So it was just a way of soldiers go into a country how do you behave if you're going and saying we in our, our particular area was the horn of Africa and like, why are we going in Africa? But like men talk to men and women talk to women and here's what you have to worry about for food and here's dietary stuff. And so we would create these scenarios all in 3d. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point, you know, part of where I'm at now is I have a, a really, really close friend of mine and we're doing special operations combat stuff for, uh, for animation. And so I've just been able to over time, you know, develop my skill and stay in that realm. So doing oil and gas, doing video game stuff, doing military stuff. Um, it's been that way pretty consistently in my life. Like for two decades, right? Yeah. Two so decades. this is, this is my, my 20th year this year. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So how long ago did you uh, found Yahweh games? Yeah, uh, uh, Yahweh games, or I don't know games. We've been uh, a company in, in May of this year will be our, fifth year i think mm -hmm. i think it'll be year five um but yeah I, I i for the first three i didn't say a word i i didn't want to talk to anybody about what we were doing because i didn't want people to steal our idea i didn't want people to to do it better than us and we've we're we're hitting it hard like it plus if, if i have students that i come in and i can't prove that like what i'm teaching them is superior to what these other schools are, are instructing plus I can't pay them to do work. And that's what separates us from the other schools anyways, is like once the art Institute sends somebody out, they're gone. Like they don't do work for the art Institute, but if I'm training people up and I'm going to certify them and actually give them a physical certification, mm -hmm. well, why would I want to hire out? I'm going to hire them. So All they're right. paying me to teach them. And then I'm paying them to do the work. And that's, that's the reason why we're, we're so advanced in what we're doing. And I say advanced, it's a simple concept, but no, again, nobody's doing it. Yeah, so that's that doesn't sound like like I went to the school animation mentor and there was none of that. Like once you're you're done, you're done, and then you there you go, fly little birdie. They do they were they did have some help you get jobs kind of things and that kind of stuff, but 
<laughs> so why the change from Yahweh games to Adonai? So, okay, I'm Jewish, mm -hmm. but I am a, uh, I'm a hardcore Jew. Like I, I love God with all my heart. Okay. And, and um, I'm very zealous for God. And I was like, okay, I see all these other companies with all these other business names with their God on it. I, I want something with my partner on it. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, Hashem is my partner. And so I was probably a little too zealous for my own good. And I just have, I have a good board and they're like, look, man, you're offending a lot of other Jews and you don't need to be doing that. So let's just change the name over. So we're in the process of rebranding and re and basically transitioning out as to not offend my kinsmen. That's, that's pretty much the straight answer for that. Hmm, that makes sense. Okay. So we got a comment in here that somebody said, I'll post it up. And I just want to get your uh, response to this. The amount of shade thrown in this presentation is frankly insane. 90% of artists don't know what they're doing. Movie animators can't do game animation. I used to be a racist toward programmers, <laughs> etc. So I want to hear your comments on that. All right, all right. There's, there's, there's a lot going comments. on here. Right, so yeah. so let's 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 deal with the racist part. Look, I've had a very difficult time with programmers in general. It was meant as a joke and an extreme joke, and sometimes my jokes don't land. Okay. So if if you're offended at that, I apologize. Just ignore it, all right? It's it's not it's not anything that I'm. I don't hate programmers. Like, look, I have programmers that are some of my best friends in my whole life. I'll lay my life down for them, all right? So let's move forward. I pushed past my pain, and I'm growing as a man. I have right. to tell you, I want to comment on this. So I I made a mobile game, right? Um, and it should have taken just you know four to six months or something with the programmer. I went through three programmers, and it took a year and a half. It was the biggest pain in my butt ever. It made me not ever want to make games again. And it was because of my experience with the different programmers. Now, so I understand that pain, right? And it, that doesn't mean all programmers are like that. Right, right, it was right, just like, right. In my experience with these particular things, the things that were the biggest issue with the programmers, right? But it is what it is, right? You know, it's, it's just, I, I get where you're coming from. So okay, let me so address the 90% area, okay? Look. You have hard surface program, uh, hard surface artists, and you have organic artists. And art for art's sake is typically beautiful. You can go on ZBrush, and those guys will smoke me on any day of the week. All right, and I'm a ZBrush artist. I pride myself, and I know my anatomy in and out. And um, you know, I I wouldn't be I wouldn't be uh, on on the roster with the United States government if 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 a knife gets driven into the thigh of a of a person, and we're cutting arteries and veins and i have to show that so I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is this is i have that video on my site you guys can go look at that i could put in the link in the in the in the, in the uh, discord my point is when i'm dealing with 90 percent of the artists that come across my desk that what i'm looking at i go on art station these particular tiny group of of anatomy artists are not working for the technical animator now I don't know how how many times you're you're Mr. Long you're you're an animator. How many mm -hmm. times have you dealt with poor edge loops in the shoulder, in the clavicle, in the scapula, in the lats, or like the elbows twist and yeah, oh my, right? it destroys the shoulder just by trying to do this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm talking about. Like, and no it, amount of Euler filter will fix it. <laughs> that's right. Or or you have to create an extra bone that doesn't doesn't work inside the body, right? So. You know, take what I'm saying for a grain of salt. If you think I'm insulting everybody for the sake of insulting, I apologize if I come off as offensive. I know that I have the personality. Everybody's going to either hate me or everybody's going to love me. And I've just kind of like embraced it. So I'm I'm cool. I, I hope you have a great day. That's all I have to say. I'm, I'm really pleased that you take the time out to call me out on my crap. Mm -hmm. So. Let's go. What you got? Any hey, more man. questions? Oh, the other one he said: movie animators can't do game animation. If oh, I just, I, let me speak to this. Okay, yeah, so animating yeah, yeah, yeah. for a game and like loops is different than animating because uh, I was trained as a like a movie, a film animator, right? So it was all so about was the acting, and it was like so learning how to do the loops. That's a completely different. It's a different skill set within that skill set, right? So if you're trained in one thing, it's like if you're trained to paint landscapes, 
you can't go in and paint body parts because you don't know yet, right? Until you train to do that. It's the same kind of thing, right? Like you could paint Bob Ross stuff all day, but you could you paint a portrait? You know what I mean? It's it's just sure. that kind of thing. So I get sure. what you're saying. Let, let me ask you this. In, in your experience, when you're hiring an animator, even looking at resumes, how many years of experience minimum do they even want to look at you before you even actually get in? Do you do you, do you know that number? Do I know it? Yeah, oh. like six years. But really, I don't. I think it's all about the real, right? Because yeah. you can like, uh, especially like, because there were people coming out of school that were just like straight rock stars, right? Like, they're like, so there would I don't know how many every time every graduation was two or three hundred people, right? And it would be like one person would get a job at Pixar, right? Everybody wants to be a Pixar animator. One person would get a job, maybe. Right. And they would be a rock star. It was because their demo reel was they put their second best thing up front to go, ooh. Then they put all of their best stuff and then they put their very best thing at the last of the. There's no, because what I learned in there is you're only as good as your worst you animation. That's right. Right. So, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know what the years are now. I mean, it's been a while. I was a lead animator on a couple of video games. Um, not ham said I found this very informative and wanted to thank you for your time. And you know what? It's it's like a lot of things. What you do is you take the meat and get rid of the fat. Some things may or may not be to you. He just has a lot of information. And I think this is this was excellent. So we are gonna go now. If you're an indie dev and, and you need money, <laughs> here we go. This next one is let's scroll down. The uh the mega grants epic. Mega Grants for Indie Developers. And it's got my buddy, uh, Christian Allen. And he's from, guess what, Epic Games. He is going to be, I hope that they're ready. I'm just going to say we're ready. So thank you so much. Hang out for a second and until the broadcast ends. All right. Thank you, and guys. Then, thank uh, you, Mr. Powell. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Long. And we'll see you in just a few minutes. All right.